Good morning and welcome to worship at Messiah Lutheran Church on Skidaway Island in Savannah, Georgia. We welcome our in-person guests here and those who might be live streaming at home or who watch the recording later this week. We gather to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Announcements. It's the 18th Sunday in the season of Pentecost. Our reader today is Brad Van Heusen. Special music is provided by Tom Olson on tuba and Amir Polite on percussion. Flowers are given by the Boyden Price family in loving memory of Robert William Boyden and Kathleen Mitchell Price, and by Patty and Clark Field in celebration of family October birthdays, daughter Lori and grants Carly and Z. The eternal candle is given this month by Lana and Eric Gilster to the glory of God. Stewardship letters have been mailed on Friday and you will receive them in the coming days and we ask that you please give prayerful consideration to the exercise of your financial commitment to Messiah. You will have a, included in the mailing is a pledge card and we ask that you, the congregation, return it in the accompanying envelope by Sunday, October 27th, and the pledges will be dedicated on Sunday, October 13th during worship. I again want to thank the congregation for their support of this ministry. Your support has been steady and strong. People ask, how are we doing with giving? We're down about 7%, so if you are behind, there's still time this year to catch up, but overall, God is taking care of us and that's only because of you. We are offering another Messiah mingling where people can gather in driveways, socially distant and socialize. There are, it is this week, Tuesday, October 6th, or Thursday, October 8th at 4.30. Sign up by emailing or calling the church office by Monday at 10 a.m., and then you can get a location. Finally, uh, I want to let you know about an opportunity that Messiah has found uh, this past week. And it involves a police officer couple here in Savannah, Georgia. Husband and wife team as police officers for Savannah PD. And the husband, John Doors II, was diagnosed with APL leukemia on September 10th. And it's a treatable form of leukemia, but he and his fiance Corey are both officers and have a blended family. Well, um, John Doors grew up in Devon, Pennsylvania at St. Luke's Lutheran Church. One of our founding members was a part of that church, Jenny Romheiser, if you know her. Also, uh, Messiah's Andrea Falcons comes from that church. They're, they both know this family. And uh, Teddy's parents are here to uh, assist the family during this time of need. And as I talked to Lori, uh, the, the mother, we, we discussed ways Messiah might support them. And what they really could use and support right now is meals. So I want you to consider if there's a way your household could supply a meal for this family. Uh, it's two adults and four children, so a blended family that's not small. And uh, I thought this was something Messiah could do. So uh, please give that some thought. I'll give all these details and a link to a website uh, and the Messiah Minute this coming week. But I wanted to let you know we have an opportunity to support a family in need, a family with connections to our church and uh, connections to the community. And so I want to invite you to consider ways to help them. If you're interested right away, you can talk to me after church or call the office on Monday. For our gospel reading today, on which the sermon will be based, Jesus tells a parable, a parable about a vineyard that has wicked tenants. And Jesus' words uh, speak indictment to the religious leaders of he, his day, but we consider our lives being entrusted to a vineyard in this message today. I think that's everything for announcements, so we will now have a time of centering and reflection during the prelude. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
please stand for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Trusting God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sin against God and one another. Eternal God, our Creator, in you we look and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we were still sinners, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. We continue with the gathering song. Let us pray, beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your Spirit to know the things that are right, and by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading this morning is from Isaiah 5. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done for it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed. 
and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected, just, expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a, heard a cry. Word of the Lord. Let us read responsibly Psalm 80, beginning at verse 7. Restore us, O God of hosts, let your face shine upon us, and we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt, you cast out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea and its branches to the river. Broken down its wall so that all who pass by pluck off its grapes. The wild boar of the forest has ravished it and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven. Behold and tend this vine, preserve what your right hand has planted. The second reading is from Philippians 3. Paul writes, If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under its law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. According to Matthew. Glory Jesus said, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. The tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. 
Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They, the listeners to this parable, said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of heaven will be taken away from you and given to people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone whom it fails, falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace be to you from our Lord God, the Father in heaven, and his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, we are surrounded by gardens. We are surrounded by places where things um, are to grow and other things are not to grow. There's a mission with each garden. Here uh, on this island, as I've talked about before, there is a community garden where people have a plot of land, there's a fence around it, it's protected, and they can grow what they want in that garden. But always, not always having a community garden goes well. There are different competing uh, approaches or visions for how that space should go. The managers must listen to the gardeners and way what is going on with what they want to the mission of that place. This weekend, is in light of our Savannah Golf Championship, it goes to say that uh, the golf courses here are like gardens. They are tended and manicured, fertilized, watered, intentionally uh, producing lush green grass by people who are like farmers. Some things need to grow, other things should not grow, such as weeds. And that requires effort uh, and intentionality. And sometimes managing those gardens, um, there can be conflict there. Your lawn is a garden, which requires tending and care and intentionality. There are gardens everywhere. And Jesus today has a parable about a vineyard, which is like a garden being entrusted to, the, to others to care for it. So my image I want you to keep this morning is being entrusted to a vineyard. Because at this point in Matthew, Jesus is getting in hot water. He's not just going around the countryside and preaching and healing. He's now in the capital city of Jerusalem, We've already observed, you know, his grand entrance a la Palm Sunday. He's hanging around the temple, and he's communicating and teaching with the authorities of that place. And there is back and forth between the chief priests and the scribes. And there's even anger, as we heard last week, when Jesus told those authorities that even prostitutes and tax collectors will get into heaven before they would. So we're dropped in a section where there's a lot of stress and anger and conflict, things we don't always want in our religious life. But it's here. The authorities are after him. Throughout these chapters, they're laying traps and asking him leading questions, trying to put Jesus in a corner. And before long, when that all fails, they will be after him with swords and the cross. Jesus 
draws his authority from God himself, whereas his opponents usually would argue by referring to other teachers and other rabbis, and this frustrated them. So here we are in this parable. There's a lot of negative imageries of violence and the word wretched and um, uh, frustration and killing. We might say, well, what's the point here? What's at stake? What's at stake is caring for God's creation and God's mission in the world. And who's most apt to do that? And Jesus tells his audience and us how, what's at stake here through this parable, a story that teaches heavenly truths and earthly imagery using the image of a vineyard. And when Jesus tells this parable, uh, we read it in an allegory, kind of a form where every word and image stands for something other than what it actually is being said at the time. So you got a vineyard, a vineyard owner, you've got tenants, you've got uh, servants who come, and who are all these people in the parable? The challenge of reading an allegorical parable is to discover the actual meaning of the words written down. And I have to say that you have to be careful and acknowledge the limitations of allegory as a way that we can do spiritual care. You might think you're someone in the parable, but you might not be. Parables are slippery like that. But let's just see what's going on here. Because in this allegorical text, the God is the landowner, we're certain of that. The land of Israel is the vineyard. The members of the Jewish establishment, those who Jesus was speaking to at this parable exactly to, well, they're the tenant farmers. And the prophets of the Old Testament are the representatives of God who came to collect what was due. Jesus is the son who finally comes to collect, and the one who was killed. And the church group, the church, you and I, were the ones that are implied at the end of the parable, invited to work in the vineyard at the end of the parable. So that's how this parable has been often understood. I mean, we might consider it in the larger story of the Bible where God made creation and put humans in it. And he told Father Abraham and Sarah to come to this place, the promised land, that God would bless them. Why would God bless them? Because they're moral, upstanding people? No, because God chose them and blessed them so that the world would be blessed by them and their descendants. God would bless them so that they would be a blessing to others. That's what God wants for God's people. God loves the world, wants the world to be blessed through certain people, through you and me, there's a responsibility in this, says the parable. There's a danger. So the parable is a return to the question, who is entrusted to care for the vineyard, to provide fruits of the Spirit? And I just have to say, this, par or this parable begins with kind of an annoying reality. There was a landowner who planted a fence, dug, planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, built a watchtower. These are all things you need to grow grapes. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. Where is God? What is God doing? Is God an 
absentee landowner far away doing who knows what and we're left here to work and squabble among ourselves? It kind of takes us in that direction, doesn't it? That God isn't there and that we're here by ourselves. I've been noticing a lot lately in conversations on the cell phone, how you're talking and then the other person's talking and, you know, I don't want to interrupt. And so there's this silence. And in that silence, I ask, are you still there? And usually they'll say yes, right? But sometimes in that silence, the call has been dropped. And that person's off who knows where in their car talking away, not realizing it's dropped, and you're sitting there holding a silent, disconnected cell phone. Isn't that how it is with God sometimes? We think we're connected. We think God is there. But there has been a break, an interruption. And that living with faith in God is trusting that God is listening despite the static. Yes, it is, does seem like God's an absentee landlord, but uh, we need to stay with God and trust he's working his way in our lives, knowing that even if it seems like he's far away, like the parable, he's invested in producing fruit. So the landlord went to a faraway country. And we've got this situation which was common for the day. Tenants who would work the land. And then at the time of harvest, the um, servants of the landowner, or slaves, collected the produce, and the tenants would get paid out of that. So it's a classic labor versus management conflict, where human beings are the laborers, and God is in management. And the tenants would say to themselves, all day we work and toil, we sit here in the hot sun, growing these grapes, and we never see the landowner. When harvest comes, this landowner sends his emissaries, and they say, here you go, here's a few blessings, getting a small share, but the vast amount goes in the pocket of that landlord, and the workers resent that. But you can hear the landowner's side, right? He says, hey, it's my land. I can do with it what I want. You don't have to work here for me. If you can find a better job someplace else, go ahead. But as far as I'm concerned, we are creating jobs here. I invest a lot of my own wealth in creating this vineyard, digging the wine press, building the tower. Each year I take a risk that the weather and sun will cooperate for the harvest. The real risk is with me, says the landowner. And you all seem ungrateful. And it's at that point, when the servants are set to collect the harvest, when the tenants seize the servants, beat and kill them. It's at that point where the owner of the vineyard sends his son. They'll listen to me. Surely they'll listen to my son. And when the tenants saw the son, they said, wait, he's the heir. If we kill him, we can get more money. So you've got this beautiful vineyard. And the tenants or the occupiers who maintain the vineyard are greedy. They've lost track of why they're supposed to be there. And in their greed, they're killing and beating. 
And we could sit here comfortably today and say, well, those are the Jews of that time, and these first servants who were to collect the, pro the produce were the prophets, and the Son is Jesus. And so we don't need to worry about how this parable might apply to us. And that's where we would be wrong. Because we are in the vineyard. We have been entrusted to the care of God's place. And the danger is, well, greed or loss of mission, however you want to frame it. There's a story out of Tanzania I heard in seminary about an old man who owned a um, beautiful land that would produce the finest coffee in the region. And my professor at the seminary approached this elderly man. He was from Denmark, okay, so he was white, and he had convinced this man in old age that he should will the coffee farm to the school that was nearby. And the logic being, you know, they're colonists, they kind of took over the land, and this coffee farm would produce a crop that would support the school that would educate the children in the region. It was all set up. It was really a good move. But when that old Dane died, word got out amongst the villagers that he was giving it to the people. You know how word can get confused. And before long, that coffee farm was so full of squatters and people uh, vying to get their own piece of the land that it was a big mess to sort out and communicate that this land was for the school. Sometimes greed or desperation moves people into the wrong position when God has a bigger plan in mind. So there it comes, then, to you and me. Where are we in this story? Can we identify with the tenants who um, are frustrated by the lack of blessings? Or can we see that we are laborers in the garden and that this garden is made to bless the world? In that way, your life is a vineyard to produce spiritual fruits to love and bless the others. And in this way, this congregation is a vineyard where we toil and produce fruit to bless others. And this story has a terrible indictment of human beings. Because deep down, sometimes we resent the landowner. Sometimes we don't like what the landowner has to say. There are, there's judgment in this text where God says, if you don't produce spiritual fruit, then we will give the vineyard to someone who will. And it has a chilling effect on us as listeners. But I want to tell you that it's no contradiction for Jesus to express both wrath and judgment. As one thinker said, God is angry at evil because God loves. It is not that God is naturally anger, but that evil provokes him. In pure love, God cannot tolerate evil. Or, put another way, where there is no sin, there is no wrath. But there will always be love in God. So God feels strongly about this vineyard. Jesus tells this penetrating uh, parable to put us on notice. And we do, as laborers in the vineyard, do get angry at God. Martin Luther wrote in a 
work called bondage of the will, that we resent the authority God holds over us sometime. We resent the fact that we are not our own masters. We resent the fact even that we don't have any alternatives. We sit here and say, God, why? Why do we have to wear these masks all the time? Why is there this virus? Will it ever go away? That is in our hearts, and we do well to acknowledge that rather than to shove it aside. Sometimes we even find grace itself condemnatory. Our reliance on God is so crucial, so much that one theologian named Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, each day we continue to betray Jesus with a kiss. And what I am saying is, is that we may at times be more like those tenants than we are willing to admit. But that Jesus presents us with this reality that we've been given a life to cultivate good and that labor in the vineyard is God-pleasing. It is who we are as Jesus' people. And the story, well, it turns into a terrible indictment because this hill country rabbi whose authority is going to have to be put to death for not indicating his authority is derived from someone else, the system will not handle it. For forgiving sinners, talking about God's kingdom of love, raising the dead, for being the rebel, the one who condemns, well, he will be condemned. But if it is in his condemnation that your life is going to begin anew. He, in the story of Matthew, is going to be raised from the dead for you. And he's going to bring you out of death into life to work, to contribute to the growth in the vineyard entrusted to us. Jesus is the promise, though rejected. Jesus is the cornerstone of your life, of my life, of life in the vineyard. To God be the glory now and forever. Amen. Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. So we're, after the prayers here, we're going to do the Lord's Prayer, but today we're blessed to have a singer, uh, to a vocalist to sing the Lord's Prayer. You'll all be invited to remain standing and pray silently as we pray with the singer the Lord's Prayer. So please stand as we continue with the prayers of intercession. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Holy God, you call us to work for peace and justice in your vineyard. Refresh the church with your life, that we may bear fruit through work and service. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Thank you for the abundant harvest of the earth. Bless and care for those whose hands bring the fruits of the earth to the tables of all who hunger. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Curb the impulses of greed and pride that lead us to take advantage of others. Grant that world leaders would seek the fruits of the kingdom for the good and welfare of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain all who suffer with the promise of new life. Assured of your presence, heal our pain and suffering and equip us to embrace all bodies aching for wholeness of mind, body, and soul. We call to mind those who are struggling today. We pray for our president 
and First Lady and all those who are infected by the coronavirus. We pray for Ardrey Martin, Grace Baucus, Judy Nord, John Dors, Jim Hazel, Hannah, Willane Liu, Wade Winslow. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all managers in our community and for all who seek employment. Give hope and a future to those who lack meaningful work, those who have been marginalized or abused in the workplace, and those who desire new opportunities. Lord, in your prayer, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for all the saints who teach us to live faithfully in your vineyard. May our chorus join theirs until our labor is complete. We pray for those who are mourning, and we name the family and friends of Susan Morris, friend of Babette. Comfort them in their sorrow. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We will now pray the Lord's Prayer silently as it is sung. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy King. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Remain standing for our sending song. I'll remind you that we uh, humbly ask that we, you exit from beginning with the rear pews and going forward. Thank you. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. 